Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, we have a very special guest uh, this morning um, for our cardiovascular medicine grand rounds, Dr. Dan Roden. I uh, had a pleasure of having dinner with him uh, uh, and a few others yesterday evening. So before uh, um, we get, uh, we asked Dr. Roden to give his, uh, his talk this morning, I'd like to invite a longtime friend, uh, Dr. Churchwell, to introduce him, um, and uh, we can get started. Thanks, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Eric. Uh, I was told to be brief and to the point, although it took me about a year and a half to get him here, so it's actually uh, uh, part of the overall journey. I want to thank uh, Dr. Mena and Dr. Velasquez and Dr. Friedman for their indulgence uh, as part of the Clemens Lecture to bring Dr. Roden here. Dan Roden is one of the international leaders in the development of ideas and models for personalized medicine. He's going to talk about that today. He was born in Montreal, Canada. He's a graduate of McGill University. Uh, he, was on the, he was the managing editor of the Daily Staff, which we talked about last night, which he takes great pride in, which actually probably speaks to the fact that he's such a great writer. Uh, he went to medical school at McGill University, um, and his connection with McGill is actually longstanding. If you look through his CV, uh, he is definitely one of their uh, uh, graduates who they uh, celebrate and ask back on multiple occasions. His internship and residency was at the Royal Victoria Hospital. And in 1978, he came to Vanderbilt as a clinical research fellow in pharmacology, and he never left. Uh, Dan has his own w Wikipedia page, which uh, some of us uh, don't have. <laughs> On that page, it says his research program has studied the phenotypic consequences of genomic variation, focusing on pharmacogenetics and on arrhythmia susceptibility. Uh, that's just a small part of, I think, of what uh, his length and breadth of his research and all of his interests have been in the arena of genetics, uh, uh, the impact of genetics in terms of cardiovascular disease, but also almost all diseases and the ideas and the opportunities around personalized medicine. Dan is the professor of medicine, pharmacology, and biomedical informatics at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, where he holds the Sam L. Clark Endowed Chair and serves as the Senior Vice President for Personalized Medicine. He's also the director of, of Vanderbilt University's BioView Project, which I'm sure he will discuss. He's also the director of the John Oates Institute for Experimental Therapeutics. Uh, I don't capture everything he's actually doing on campus. Uh, it is uh, it's multiplicity in terms of what his what he does uh, on a daily basis at Vanderbilt. Just a few uh, of his honors and awards in the past. He was elected to the American Society for Clinical Investigation. He won the Heart Rhythm Society Distinguished Scientist Award. He won the Functional Genomics and Translational Biology Inaugurable Medal of Honor at the American Heart Association. He's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's also, for 25 years, running uh, on the list of the best doctors in America. Uh, if, it, if you may know how that list is generated, it is a list that's generated by uh, a survey that's sent out by the company to physicians asking the question, if you had a problem with one of your patients, issues that you uh, could not figure out, who would you want to see your patient? So uh, I got to know Dan because of uh, we did clinic on the Tuesday morning, I think at Vanderbilt when I was there. So uh, that makes sense to me that he is on the best doctors of America list. He has lectured on every continent except Antarctica. I couldn't figure it out whether he'd been to Antarctica or not. Uh, he's a member of the 1000 Citation Club, if you look at his CV, of all the manuscripts, books, reviews uh, that he has done in his, in his uh, remarkable career. Uh, he is a true mentor, and I, I mentioned that because as I was reading through his CV, there was a list of the graduate students that he had actually mentored through their theses. The first one on the list is Dr. Jeffrey Balzer. Uh, isn't that interesting? So, uh, so uh, if you may not know who Dr. Balzer is, Dr. Balzer is the CEO of Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Vanderbilt Health, and he's also the D in the Vanderbilt Medical School. What's not on that list are actually people I got to know when I was at Vanderbilt that he actually mentored. If it be myself, Mark Anderson, who's chair of medicine at Johns Hopkins, Darwin Darbar, who is chief of cardiology at the University of Illinois. Uh, Dan is a doctor's doctor. Uh, a short story we talked about last night a bit I was going to mention here of how I got to know him and how, I, uh, how, how much respect I hold him in. Uh, 
At Vanderbilt, we actually, on Tuesdays, instead of grand rounds, we have actually the clinical uh, uh, conference. We have a cardiology clinical conference. That conference actually is an amalgam of case history uh, presentations that are led by uh, attendings. You sign up during the year, and you have to actually present conference. You may present it with a fellow. You could present it with a resident, but it's your responsibility. In my role at Vanderbilt after I, before I left, when I was the executive director and chief medical officer of the Vanderbilt Heart and Vascular Institute, I was actually not on that list but I decided to actually jump in and take a Tuesday. I wanted to do that specifically because I wanted to take an opportunity to, to bring to the fellows and residents uh, an evaluation of a disease process and of a patient to give them a sense of how a differential diagnosis is uh, brought forth in regards to a patient, uh, how to do that in a way that actually leads to the right diagnosis. Uh, so that CPC, I had two people in mind to actually do it. The first person actually I asked, and he said yes, was Dan Roden. It was an elegant hour, an elegant hour actually of, of, of breaking apart what happens to someone as they come into the emergency room for just a viral illness and find that they have a remarkable pathological cardiovascular disease problem, discussing that, dissecting it, and actually coming to the right diagnosis. So I'll give you Dan Roden. I'm sure it's going to be another elegant hour. Dan? minutes because he, I, prom I asked him to make this short and that didn't work. Um, so thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, I'm going to talk fast and I might even have to skip over some slides because this talk is a little on the long side and, uh, um, and now it's even longer. Uh, these are my disclosures. I don't really have any. I, I spent a lot of time giving advice to other people um, and this is what I want to talk about. So I'm going to start with some cases and think about uh, the electronic health record as a, as a, as a research tool, and then uh, talk a little bit about pharmacogenomic implementation and where we are with that. So <clears throat> this is a headline in the Nashville, Tennessean. 20 years ago or so, I told some of you about this case yesterday. So this is a 13-year-old girl who died playing basketball. We, uh, she had a, sister, a nine-year-old sister, so the nine-year-old sister um, has her ECG, and her, her, her QT interval is... 550, which is way too long, and so she has congenital long QT syndrome, um, and we actually discovered the, the variant in her, uh, in our research labs, because there was no commercial testing at the time, uh, and uh, this is the family tree, the, the, the girl who, uh, is there, there's no pointer, huh? <laughs> there's a pointer, so, what? Yeah, I don't know, this is, this is way too complicated. Um, and I, you know, and I have to. No, it doesn't. It's not going to happen. That's it. So she has a QT of 551. Her sister is the, uh, Her sister died. We don't know what the QT was. And and then we looked at the parents because this, presumably one of them is a mutation carrier. They're, everybody has a normal Q, Q, QT interval, but it turned out that her mother was the mutation carrier. QT was normal at rest. It was abnormal during exercise. And. The really disturbing thing for me, anyway, is the grandfather has a totally normal QT and died of a stroke in his 70s. So, you know, if we had detected a long QT interval mm -hmm. or a long QT interval mutation in him, I'm not sure what we would have done except try to screen the entire family. Anyway, yeah, there's a, and the, and the, the footnote to that story is that you know, now I followed that nine year old. She's 29. She's, she's had, she has a defibrillator. She's had three shocks, two of them for fractured leads. Uh, she has a son who is a mutation carrier. She's a cardiac nurse. End of story. Well, I, not the end of the story. Here's another story, a 57-year-old woman with uh, uh, risk factors who comes in with chest pain, gets a stent, uh, gets clopidogrel, Plavix started, and then over the course of the year has lots and lots and lots of events. And everybody says, more clopidogrel, more clopidogrel. Keep on taking your Plavix. And uh, she's finally discovered to be a poor metabolizer. So Plavix, as you may or may not remember, is a, uh, is a prodrug and has to be bioactivated by CYP2C19. And if you have loss of function alleles one or two in CYP2C19, Plavix efficacy is either reduced or eliminated. And so she started on Crassigrel. And I'll come back to this at the end, if I have time, Dr. Churchwell. So um, I think the interesting thing about those kinds of vignettes, those kind of very special cases, is that they're unusual. They're not, I wouldn't know, 
I wouldn't say they're rare, but they're unusual. But in order to sort of treat people as individuals, you have to develop an evidence base. And the evidence base has to come from a very large denominator. You have a large denominator, and you're going to find these unusual cases, and then you're going to be able to say, this person should be treated differently from average. So that's the idea, and that's what I call the fundamental paradox of precision medicine. So the kinds of people that we're going to look for are people who are pharmacogenomic outliers, people with unrecognized Mendelian disease or recognized disease. I'll come back to that. Uh, when I look at our electronic record, and I realize it's a skewed sample just like it would be here, there's, you don't find people who take one drug, and you don't find people who have only one disease. And then the other thing that I think we can do with very large data sets is we can start to look at common diseases like heart failure, like atrial fibrillation, like diabetes, and start to get subsets of people who should be treated differently, managed differently, and uh, perhaps even per get personalized drug targets. So I, these are slides I stick on yesterday after talking to Eric. The, uh, I came to Vanderbilt to do clinical pharmacology. And at the time, clinical pharmacology was and is one of the crown jewels of the academic enterprise at Vanderbilt. The other crown jewel in the academic enterprise was um, the development of biomedical informatics. We invested very, very early and very extensively in biomedical informatics. This is an older slide. So there's, there's our electronic, there's our pre-electronic health record. And in, uh, in 2000, this is a 2015 slide, but there are now over 100 faculty members in the Department of Biomedical Informatics. So it's part of the culture at Vanderbilt. And um, so in, in you know, it feels like a century ago, but in 2006, there was an institutional commitment made to this idea of developing personalized medicine in a lot, in a lot of different ways at a you know, strategic planning retreat. And if you do a PubMed search, uh, and I updated this yesterday, uh, you can see that there's been an explosion of activity, not only at our place, but you know, nationally and, and internationally. Uh, the one that I'm happy with is the first publication was this one, which basically described our biobank. If I had to describe, if I had to develop our biobank today, I would do it differently. And there are lots of people, including here, who are doing it differently. Uh, and and I guess this is the uh, first adopter uh, disadvantage. That's the term that people have told me about. So. Uh, uh, I'm happy to have been early. I'm unhappy to have been early. So our biobank is called BioView. Uh, the fundamental phenotyping platform is the electronic health record itself. We strip out identifiers to the extent that we can. We can talk all about that if people want. That's Tennessee there. That's Nashville in the star. And uh, we have 250,000 samples of DNA that are waiting to be analyzed. Some of them have been analyzed extensively. Some of them haven't had a single nucleotide analyzed yet. So uh, we're a little disorganized, but uh, we have over 100,000 people who have had chips done. So uh, we're getting to the point where it's starting to get really interesting. <clears throat> One of the tools that we have is to find cases and controls in our electronic record. So people can act, this is a tool where people can ask the question, I wonder if there are enough cases in the record so I can answer a question. So here's uh, uh, one example. This is the face page of this, uh, what we call the record counter. Uh, you search over there, and then you drag and drop whatever you want. So medicate, this is medications. You, you look, and there are 56,998 people who have clopidogrel in their medication list. I thought that's a little low, and then I did, uh, this is embarrassing. So you search for Plavix, you get more. And, uh, and, and if you t search the intersection, it's 90,000. The numbers don't exactly agree with each other, you can see, and there's a reason for that. If somebody wants to ask me afterwards, I can tell you that. Then down here, there's this BioView samples filter, and you can click on samples that have records that have DNA samples attached. So I do that. Actually, I didn't do that. All I did was ask people who, who had genotyping data that was available already. So obviously, people who have genotyping data available have a DNA sample. And there's uh, 12,910 people who have Plavix and genotyping data available on one of those two platforms. So that's an experiment. You can then go crazy and figure out what, what, what you want to do with that data set. Uh, and after talking to Dan Jacoby yesterday, I, I thought I'd throw this in. So I don't know which ICD-9 or 10 code to use for amyloidosis. I'm not sure I need to know. But there are 2,127 people who carry an amyloid code in their electronic health record. And there are 303,684 people who are African American. The intersection is 335 cases. And in the BioView set, there's 140 cases. 
So I wonder how many of those carry your mutation. Interesting question. And we could answer that. I mean, it's sort of, and that, that search took me 30 seconds, and I'm happy to do other searches later. Um, so what we can do with those kinds of capabilities, we can find cases and controls for whatever you want. Uh, we can export them to other electronic health record systems. We established that by working in a network called Emerge, the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, which <coughs> has been in existence since 2007, and, and we think will be part of the next cycle, but we're not sure. Um, we can replicate signals for known diseases. That was something that we did very early on. People said, well, you know, the phenotypes are pretty crappy and uh, pretty <coughs> not good. And uh, what we did was we developed algorithms to find people with common diseases and then asked the question, do those people carry well-recognized common polymorphisms that confer risk? And, and every polymorphism we looked at uh, replicated the, what was in the literature. Um, we can study... I shouldn't, I shouldn't digress much, but I can say this paper was submitted to the New England Journal, got seven reviews. At the end, they were all pretty complimentary, but then the associate editor wrote to, the deputy editor wrote to us and said, in his opinion, BioView was an immoral and unethical resource, and therefore they weren't going to accept the papers. That's, that's what happens when you live outside Route 128 and try to submit something to the New England Journal. Um, so we and we've obviously studied a lot of variable drug responses. And I can talk about those forever. I'm not going to. But, but using genome-wide association studies, using sequencing da sequence data, and using um, uh, trying to replicate known candidate genes. And then we can reuse. We, what we, what, the real advantage of this is that you have the genomic data. You can reuse it for whatever experiment you want. So once, once we have the data, we can we use it over and over and over again. And this is one study where we reused it to do ECG signal uh, genome studies, and I won't get into that, but there's this word phenome-wide there. So uh, I have to say something about the word phenome-wide. Uh, so the, a normal genetic study, uh, you start with a trait. You start with something, a drug response or a trait or something, and, and then you find the, the genes of the loca, loci or the specific variants that, that confer variability in that trait. So we realized as we were collecting this gigantic set of genetic data coupled to electronic health records, which have tons and tons of diagnoses for, for patients, and they're diagnoses that people come to the hospital for. We could turn the experiment on its head. So you start with a genetic variant and ask, with what human phenotype is that variant associated? And we called that phenome-wide association study, or FIWAS. I was in the room when the word FIWAS was invented. It was about 10 years ago. It's part of the genomic lexicon now. So here's a, just a couple of examples. Josh Denny was, the, was one of the geniuses behind uh, uh, behind the genome-wide association study. I'll come back to him a little later. And, and Lisa Bastarash is the other genius behind this. And uh, you will, we'll hear both of those names later as well. So um, what we did was we uh, took the, the, what's called the GWAS catalog, a catalog of well-recognized genome-wide association study results that are, that are on the web, and, and asked the question, could we replicate those results by starting with the genetic variant and going back and seeing if we could recapture the phenotype that, was, that started it all. So this is actually um, an example of pleiotropy. So the, the idea is the IRF4 variant that we were looking at has been associated with hair and eye color. And uh, when we did a FIWAS, we, oh, wrong slide. Um, this is a FIWAS for, I can't remember what this is, but they, I'm going to have to go on. But th this, is, uh, this is a FIWAS for either a variant in IRF or some other variant, I can't remember which, that, that captures not just eye, hair and eye color, but captures uh, other diseases that, that we think are associated with this. This is a, this is, this is a, this is a, uh, a SNP in a, in a gene called TERT, which is important for telomere length. And, that's, and that's, those are the phenotypes that we capture. Sorry about that. So then I gave a talk like this at NYU, where the chief of cardiology is a guy named Glenn Fishman, who's interested in the development of the conduction system. He's a basic scientist. And, and afterwards, he said he has a gene called ETV1, which he thinks is important for conduction system disease development. It turns out it's a master regulator of uh, the conduction system disease, uh, conduction system development. But he said that he was having trouble getting it published because there is no connection to human disease. So what we did was we went back, looked at ETV1 SNPs, and asked the question, are there associations with any condition in the electronic health record? So this is what the, 
plot looks like. Every dot is a test of association. The y-axis uh, is, uh, is the p-value, that log negative p-value of the association. So those two red triangles up there are the things that stand out, and, um, and they are both conduction system disease. So that was in African Americans. We do it separately in different ancestries. And in European an ancestry people, the, the top hit was other heart block code for that. And so that was published in, in JCI. And we, we may have contributed a little bit to that publication. The other thing that people have gotten very excited about, and, and we started this several years ago, is, is uh, the idea of drug repurposing. So you take a drug target, you uh, find the SNPs in the drug target, you uh, ask the question, do any of those SNPs associate with the disease for which the drug is used? And those SNPs, if they associate with the disease, then you ask the question, do they associate with anything else? And anything else they associate with could be a drug target. Or if the association's in the wrong direction, that'll be an adverse drug event. So this is a huge study that looked at that. Every one of the ones that says on the column that says phenotype is a new indication for a drug that targets that particular gene that's on the left column. And the ones that are in bold are actually predicted adverse events. The odds ratios are all hovering around one, but they're all statistically significant, you can see. And the reason that you can get those signals is because they're gigantic numbers. So this is a study that involved the UK Biobank, which is 500,000 people, although they, they weren't all in here, and 23andMe. So uh, the phenotypes are mushy, we think, but they're huge numbers, and they're probably real. So <coughs> Keith said that... Uh, uh, I'm an arrhythmia guy, and uh, so I want to digress for a second and tell you a little story that comes back to uh, where personalized medicine may be going. So this is a man who I knew, who I took care of for a long, long time. He had coronary disease. He had, uh, you know, pretty typical patient for us. And and he had uh, um, he started we started on dofetilide, which at the time was a, an investigational drug. It's a very potent blocker of a single potassium current called IKR. And two days later, he has. Uh, a very, very typical episode of torset de plant with a very long QT interval and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. We, uh, we were starting to collect DNA samples on these people because we were interested in what it is that makes people have this reaction or not. So we found a variant in a gene called KCNQ1, the same gene that was mutated in that first family I told you about, different mutation. <coughs> R583C is the variant. Uh, it's uh, not found in, at the time we looked in 400 ethnically matched controls. We now have an opportunity in very, very large data sets that are available on the web to look not in 400, but in hundreds of thousands of genomes. And this thing has been seen in, in if you look at 140,000 people, it's been seen four times. So it's not unheard of, but a pretty rare. In vitro, it affects the function of a particular potassium current called IKS. And our conclusion at this point was that this confers, a, this is a person with a mild congenital long QT syndrome that probably predisposed him to this particular reaction through mechanisms that I decided to take out, uh, the slides I decided to take out this morning. So, <clears throat> but I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing to try to find predictors of torsad. So we have a, a large grant called the Improving, Improving IPOTA, Improving Prediction of Drug Action. Three projects, one is a QT project, one is a precision phenomics project that Josh leads, and then one is a, an HLA project that, that I can talk about, but uh, uh, is irrelevant to the current story a little bit. So we're having our meeting, our, you know, our regular meetings of this large grant, and, and we sort of said, well, these are three separate projects. How are we going to make them talk to each other? So we uh, set up a system. The, the, this is an informatics thing, and, and, and I, I, I'm pretty excited by it. So <clears throat> we set up a system. Uh, where so this is a person I was taking care of uh, on the consult service a, a year two years ago, uh, <coughs> young woman with uh, uh, sepsis and antibiotics and hypokalemia and lots of things going on and she has really long QT intervals you can see and then she has an episode of torsad. Her medical record number is up there and somebody writes in the chart blah 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 blah, blah torsad and then it hits the word hits hits the save button and as soon as they hit the save button I get an email that says the word torsad appeared in this note. Now, we get lots of false positives that way, but it turns out we also get lots and lots of people who have torsad, and we go around the hospital and collect their DNA samples and consent them for various things. But there's about five times as much torsad at our hospital as we thought there was, I thought there was. So this is really nice to find people early on in their courses and, and do things to them, so or do things with them. So that's a, an ascertainment tool 
that we think is going to be important. So I have spent the last couple of decades of my life trying to figure out why, why some people get torsade and why some people don't. This is sort of a bottom line summary. Uh, about 20% of people are like that first case I showed you. Uh, they have subclinical long QT syndrome that predisposes them. We've also looked very, very hard, and there's a, a common variant in a gene called KCN-E1 that confers an odds ratio of about 10. That might be enough to get excited about telling people about. We think it might be. Uh, and then we've done genome-wide association studies after accumulating hundreds of cases, and, and we don't find very much. So <clears throat> that's the way the field was until uh, about two years ago. And uh, the story starts, the story I'm going to tell you now starts with this genome-wide association study. So this is 100,000 people, and the idea is to look at variability in the QT interval. So, uh, and when you do this, you display the results as a Manhattan plot. This is what a Manhattan plot looks like. There's, there's about 500,000 dots on here, and each one of them is the test of association between a SNP and variability in the QT interval. The top hit is in near a gene called NOS1AP. The p-value is really, really low. The effect size is 3.5 milliseconds per allele. So if you have the risk allele or the allele that prolongs the QT, your QT interval will be 3.5 milliseconds longer. So what's 3.5 milliseconds? This is an ECG. You've seen this ECG before. That, that line is 17 milliseconds wide. So you can't see 3 milliseconds. But if you add up all of those little, little effects over hundreds of thousands of SNPs, you can generate what's called a polygenic risk score. So I, I was a math guy as well as a journalist as an undergraduate. So I have to sh this is not very complicated. It's you, the score you get is you look at each SNP and decide whether they have 0, 1, or 2 risk alleles. And then you multiply it by the effect size, which in this case was 3.5 milliseconds. And when you do that, you get a, a score. And the idea is we're going to look at a series of cases. We're going to look at a series of controls. And hopefully, if our polygenic risk score works, we're going to find that cases have a higher burden of risk alleles, and, and controls have a higher burden of not risk alleles. That's what we were looking for, and that's what we found when we took our GWAS for TORSAD and looked. So there's all you want for this, for this thing is a p-value of 0.05. We got a p-value of 10 to the minus seventh. This is a, a set that was accumulated uh, as part of a Leduc network, and you can see that there is a group of people who have high polygenic risk scores, and uh, and who are out at, at the extremes, and you wonder whether you could actually apply this in clinical practice. So this is in 2017, at the beginning of what I'm calling a bow wave of excitement around polygenic risk scores. So for this particular setting, we think polygenic risk scores might be important for predicting drug-induced long QT, predicting variable penetrance in the congenital long QT syndrome. So there are people who have mutations and get stuff, and there are people who have mutations that don't, and maybe this is part of it. And then there's a group of people who have clearly have congenital long QT syndrome. We look hard, hard, hard for variants and don't find any. Maybe those are people who are right out here and have just, just enough common genetic variation. So that's, that's the long QT part of it. <coughs> but uh, there is, for those of you who uh, follow this stuff, there's, the sa there's, there's a huge literature now around the use of polygenic risk scores for every common disease that you would like. And there's people who are passionate advocates of using this in, in clinical medicine today. And there are people who are, want to know exactly where it works and where it doesn't work. Um, so the, I, have a, I have a colleague who is uh, a computational genius, and, uh, <coughs> and he, uh, he, he gave me this slide. Actually, he showed it in a lab meeting one day, and I said, send that to me. So a 50-year-old man goes to the cardiologist and says, I want to know what I need to do to stay healthy. By the way, I brought my 23andMe genotyping. So cardiologist number one, let's do your labs. And a week later, he says, you know, you're uh, AHA, ACC pooled risk equation says you're, uh, have a, you have a 12% risk of taking, of having coronary disease, uh, having a coronary disease event in the next 10 years. You, you need to exercise and start taking a statin. Cardiologist number two, well, let's plug your genetics into a computer, and five minutes later, based on your genetic risk, you have a 12% risk of coronary disease. You need to exercise and start taking a statin. So there's this sort of skepticism about where this is going to fit in. Uh, and, and, you know, you could do the coronary, you could do a polygenic risk score in a one-year-old and say, this person is at high risk. Now, I'm not sure what you're going to do about that, and that's something the community is going to have to grapple with. But there are settings in which this kind of approach might actually be really useful, and settings in which it's probably less useful. We're going to find all that out. <clears throat> 
So the, 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 the com computational genius is Jonathan Mosley. And Jonathan, this is, this is a set of slides which, let me see, let me see how I'm doing for time because um, I think it's important to tell you these kinds of stories, but I'm not sure I have all the time to do this. So, so Jonathan, uh, like I said, is a computational genius, and he thought of this idea of a virtual biomarker. So here's, here's the idea. If you, if you want to validate a biomarker uh, for a disease, what you could do is you could go to your electronic health record and find that there's lots and lots and lots of patients who had had that biomarker measured. And then you can do associations between biomarker level and phenotypes in the electronic health record. And that's what that top slide is supposed to, the top panel is supposed to show. Now the problem is that sometimes you have a biomarker that's not been measured in all those people. So what you could do, and what he thinks we can do, and I'll show you an example where it did work, is you take a group of healthy people who have had the biomarker measured and who have had genetic data done, who have had a genetic chip done. Um, so that could be Framingham or Eric or one of those large epidemiologic cohorts. And, and they have blood samples lying around, so the blood biomarkers are measured. And then you, uh, and then you create a polygenic risk score <coughs> to predict the biomarker. So um, with me so far? And then you take that polygenic risk score and go into something like BioView or the generations database that, that you're building here or the Geisinger data set, and you predict what the biomarker would be based on the genetic data. So you have a virtual biomarker, and then you do the same experiment, figure out whether it's valid or not. So does that work? Uh, we think it does. So here's an experiment that he did with the Joely Salem, who was a French visitor for a year. In that year, he probably produced 20 papers. He was a, sort of a dynamo. Um, and what we did was we looked in BioView, in our biobank, and we asked the question, <coughs> are there any associations between TSH and disease. Now, the problem is that there's lots of people who have TSH measured, but they have it measured because they have thyroid disease, or somebody thinks they have thyroid disease. So we got rid of all those people. And we just looked in the rest. And so the, the existing GWAS allowed us to make the predictor. We do the predictor and generate virtual TSH measurements. And then we display the data in something called the volcano plot. So each one of those green triangles is, is, a, is a statistically significant association. And uh, the associations go in the directions you want with thyroid disease. So a little high TSH, and you have more, you're more likely to, be, to have hypothyroidism. A little lower, you're more likely to have hyperthyroidism. What's very cool is that there's also a strong association with atrial fibrillation. And there's a literature that says that subclinical hyperthyroidism is, in fact, a driver for atrial fibrillation. This is one of three papers that appeared within a couple of months that showed the same thing. So <clears throat> we're going to start to genotype people. And there's a, a real question about what happens if you genotype people who have no phenotype. Um, and uh, we had a, an experience with this in, in the eMERGE uh, network. We were doing a pharmacogenomics project. And the pharmacogenomics project involved sequencing uh, large numbers of people with a, a, a series of genes that were involved in drug action, including two cardiac ion channel genes that happened to be targets for drug action and uh, SCN5A and KCNH2. Mutations in either of those cause long QT syndrome uh, and other diseases. So Sarah Van Dries looked at uh, the first 2,000 people that were, that were phenotyped across the network and just, or genotyped across the network and just asked how many variants do you have? So the one thing that was interesting is that lots of people have variants. These are missense variants, variants that change the amino acid sequence. Lots of people have variants. Most of those variants are really rare. Most of them actually occurred only once in this relatively small data set. We asked three labs, two commercial labs and a, and a research lab, to say, what would you report to a physician if you had this particular result in, a, in, in one of these genes? And the answer was that one lab thought 16 of them, 16 of the rare variants were pathogenic, 1, 17, 1, 24. To be fair, the field has moved along, and there are pretty standard ways of evaluating pathogenicity now. But that was what we saw. And what was really interesting was that they agreed on almost nothing. Um, and then we went back to the electronic records and asked, who has a phenotype? So out of all those people, there were two people who had a long QT phenotype. None of them had syncope. None of them had a family history of, uh, of sudden death. And there was one person with atrial fibrillation, which I think is pretty par for the course. So um, the, the issues that we have are, you know, what do you do? What do you tell people? 
What do you tell people they should do? What do you tell people their families should do? All those things are open questions right now. And lots of people are worried about this kind of phenotyping, genotyping in people without much of a phenotype. <coughs> so this is one way of looking at it. Uh, our statistician will drop in and explain why you have nothing to worry about. And the statistician would tell you that the reason you have nothing to worry about is this. I'm, I, if I show this to graduate students, my, my question is always to the audience, does anybody know what this is? This is Bayes' theorem. So you start out with a bunch of people who have low probability for having disease. They're middle-aged people who don't have a history. And it, you, know, you have a test, and it says they, they're positive. They still have a low probability. That's Bayes' theorem. So uh, the, the fact is that there are anecdotes that you will hear when people do thousands and thousands and thousands of patients like this, so patients who are discovered to have a breast cancer because they have a BRCA1 tumor. And, and, and there is this tension that says, you know, I would like to know if I'm one of those one in a thousand people who are like that. So that's, that's where the field is right now. So we've taken a different tack. And we've asked the question, um, what happens if you find people with unusual phenotypes in the electronic record, those are people who, where you might chase the genetics with more confidence that you might find something that's real. So we've created something called a phenotype risk score. Uh, and we, we wanted to call that PRS, but the field decided that PRS is polygenic risk score. So now we're trying to decide how to abbreviate this. But that's a, another thing. This is Lisa Basterash. I mentioned her earlier. So she's the genius behind this. And so her, the starting point is, um, thinking about cystic fibrosis. So you can find people with cystic fibrosis in the record by searching for the word cystic fibrosis. Not, not terribly difficult. Um, but if you just look at symptoms, here are three people who, and, and what Lisa has done is look at symptoms that are, in, uh, uh, that are well recognized to be associated with cystic fibrosis through databases like OMIM. And so here are three people. One of them has pancreatitis and bronchitis. One of them has lots of symptoms along at the top. And one of them has no matching symptoms. And so the question is, how do, you, how do you sort of give them a score to tell them whether they're at high risk or low risk for cystic fibrosis? And this is not very complicated. It's exactly the same thing. You, the, the question is what the weight is. And, and to, to make a long story short, you know, if you cough a lot, that's a symptom of cystic fibrosis. But you get no weight because everybody coughs. If you have bronchiectasis, you get a weight. And so here's the, uh, here's the, here's the, uh, the weights that she assigns. And these are the scores. And so does that help in terms of finding people with cystic fibrosis? Um, and the answer is, if you take a spiked sample of people who you know have the disease or don't, uh, there's a big difference in their scores. These are normalized scores. Um, and we did that in six common diseases. And the p-values are astoundingly low again. Uh, and the one where it didn't work was phenylketonuria. And we thought that was, that was interesting. But the fact is that phenylketonuria gets diagnosed at birth, and nobody gets the symptoms. So therefore, nobody has the symptoms in the electronic record, and it's a perfect control. So then we decided, let's go on and test this idea. And we, did a, we looked at a sample of people who had had chip data. So it's a complicated story. Those of you who follow the genetics will, will see the, the flaw in the logic in this. Uh, science didn't see the flaw, so it, 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 maybe the flaw is not so big. But we looked at about 20,000 people who had chip data. And she developed polygenic risk scores for 1,200 diseases. Um, and we uh, asked the question, do any of those diseases, we, what we did was we asked the question, how many people have high phenotype risk scores for a, a particular disease and a rare variant in the right gene? And the answer was about 3%, 4%. Most of them kidney disease. Uh, and there were 18 rare variants altogether that, that had this association. So, so we think it is possible to find people in the electronic record with a sufficient <coughs> burden of symptoms that they may have recognized, or in this case, unrecognized Mendelian disease, flag that in the HR for further study of some kind. The other, there are lots of other things that we're thinking about with the polygenic, with the phenotype risk score. Here, here's one. So this is the bane of my existence when I do, you know, when I get genetic testing. In, in long QT or anything else, a variant of uncertain significance. Um, if you look in the large databases that, that list, poly, it list uh, variants, variant frequencies, this is NOMAD. This is a little out of date because they now have, uh, well, actually, this is about right. They now have around 200,000 people with data. Uh, most of the, most of the, 
variants have no annotation with them at all. So there's tons and tons and tons and tons of missense date variants. And every time people get sequenced, there's more new variants that have never been seen before. Of the 100,000 or so that have an assertion in a database called ClinVar, most of them, the assertion is variant of uncertain significance. Very few are asserted benign or pathogenic. And so the field is facing this problem of how to how to, you know, how to interpret a variant of uncertain significance when you get that on a report. One is to use computer modeling, which uh, is a traditional way, works sort of well for many of the variants. Another is to do in vitro studies, and the traditional way is to study one variant at a time. There are now high throughput ways of doing functional genomics. We're deeply involved in that, and I won't have time to talk about that. Or the other is to look in electronic health records, which is why I'm telling you the story. So <coughs> the the last round of eMERGE uh, sequenced 25,000 people in 109 Mendelian disease genes. I call them your least favorite genes. So genes that confer susceptibility to cancer, cardiomyopathy, what have you. And we returned pathogenic variants to the patients and their physicians and used the electronic health record to figure out what to do with the variants of uncertain significance. So at Vanderbilt, we did 2,500 patients. We had 6% who had a returnable result. That's a little on the high side, most, num most numbers around 3%. And here's the distribution. About two-thirds of them are cancer susceptibility things, and the others are mainly cardiac. Um, I'm going to talk about FBN1. So that's the disease gene from RFN syndrome. So Lisa went to this data set and asked the question, how many people have a Marfan variant? And it turns out the number is, is almost 100. Five of them are known pathogenic, and all five of those had very high pathogen, have, had high phenotype risk scores. And nine of them were known to be benign. In fact, some of them are synonymous. And they have very low path phenotype risk scores. So these are, these are benign variants. And then she has, we have 82 more. And these are the 82 more. This is the map for them. And you, it doesn't take a genius to see that there's at least two on this map that are pathogenic. There are some that might be pathogenic if we had more data, and there are some that are pretty clearly benign. So you can use the electronic health record as a tool for functional genomics. So a little bit about pharmacogenomic uh, uh, implementation. We have a project at Vanderbilt called uh, PREDICT. I'll talk, tell you what PREDICT stands for in a second. But the idea is that if you have genetic data that tells you you're going to have a variant drug response, it should be in your electronic record to be used, maybe. So my, my, my quote here is, it says, I have a high polygenic risk score for QT prolongation. My doctor prescribes sotalol. Should I be worried? And I think the answer is, I don't know yet, but maybe you should. So PREDICT is, that's what it stands for. And the idea is that we will uh, find uh, drug gene pairs where the genetic variation might be important embed the genetic information into the electronic health record and have it sit there until somebody's prescribed the drug. So in the early 1980s, when I was a young fellow at Vanderbilt, uh, one of my mentors, Grant Wilkinson, who's the second to last author on this paper, was studying a drug called mephenitoin. Nobody in this room has ever prescribed or probably never heard of mephenitoin. Um, and, uh, and he, was, he gave volunteers a single dose of this drug and then collected urine to look at urinary metabolite. So urinary metabolite is 4-hydroxymethanetone. The name of the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is methanetone 4-hydroxylase. And most people had urinary metabolite. There were four out of the 150 people that he studied who had no urinary metabolite at all. So they're poor metabolizer for this trait. And I gave Grant a hard time. I said, what? Well, you're wasting your time for studying a drug that no one's ever heard of, and why would you bother? So time passes. Fast forward. We're, we're, we're designing PREDICT. The FDA does us a favor, uh, and they relabel clopidogrel and put a black box around it. And they say, you know, the efficacy of Plavix or clopidogrel depends on activation to an active metabolite through CYP2C19. And if you happen to know that some, somebody's a CYP2C19 poor metabolizer, do something else. And it turns out that as methanetone hydroxylase is CYP2C19. So there is a reason that we need to uh, interact a lot with our basic science colleagues. So we, uh, we, now do, we now do preemptive pharmacogenetic genotyping. We display the data in EPIC in an incredibly inelegant way, and we're working on trying to get that better. And the main thing is that there's point-of-care decision support that fires if somebody has variant genetics and 
uh, is prescribed a drug like clopidogrel. Uh, when we looked at the first 13,000 people who we studied in, in, uh, in the PREDICT program, they're 3%, 2.7% 2, 2, 2 had, uh, uh, were homozygous for the loss of functional alleles. So giving them clopidogrel is you know, like giving them placebo, like the case that I showed you. There's another 20% or so that, have, um, that are heterozygous. If you knew that, you might lean towards something else or you might increase the dose of clopidogrel. This is looking only at uh, five variants that are relatively common. In fact, the STAR2 variant is the one that's overwhelmingly common. And STAR3 exists in Asian populations and it's, it, has a, it has a reasonable little frequency. Those others are pretty rare. Um, so the problem is that that's five variants. If you look in NOMAD, which I mentioned to you before, there are hundreds and hundreds of missense variants in this gene. Nobody knows what their function is, but I'm, I'm convinced that some people with variant responses to clopidogrel will have that because of these rare variants. And the other thing is that when we looked in the first 10,000 people and asked the question, you know, how many people have a variant in one of the drug pharmacogenes that we're studying? And the answer is the vast majority of people have something. Now, they may never get that drug, but if they get that drug, they would like to know, and their doctors would like to know, we think. What is it that makes cardiologists change from clopidogrel to something else? And, and this slide actually tells you the answer. The answer is personal opinions. Doctors like to practice medicine based on what they deeply believe, often based on not very much data. So we looked at... Uh, a, are high volume interventional cardiologists and ask the question when they're when they're told this is a person with variant pharmacogenetics what should they change did they change and the answer was some everybody changed a little bit sometimes but some people changed a lot and some people changed not very much the uh, the difference between these is 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 the the axis is how many people are are on Plavix versus how many people are on something else if they're if they have normal genetics which is on the left and if they have variant genetics which is on on the right so nobody no no cardiologist changed every single patient so that's because some people can't afford prasugrel or ticagrel or some people are not eligible for it sometimes we deliver the genetic data too late so there's some legitimate explanations <clears throat> and then there are some sort of personal opinion explanations. So yeah, I'm going I'm to rant for a second. Um, this is a patient who uh, was on sotalol, developed renal failure, developed high plasma concentrations of sotalol, and got torsat. And that's predictable. Uh, in fact, it says in the, in the, in the label for sotalol, it says, here's a, there's a table that says how to adjust the dose of sotalol if you have renal failure. And, and everybody in there, nobody in this room would ever take care of a patient who was taking sotalol and not adjust the dose or stop the drug if they got renal failure, right? And, and there's no randomized trial. We just, we just understand how drugs work. And that's, so <clears throat> on the other hand, there's been a real reluctance, people call it genetic exceptionalism or disexceptionalism, to adopt pharmacogenetic variants. And part of it is that it's not like black and white. It's not like every single person Whoever who is a poor metabolizer and gets uh, gets clopidogrel is going to drop dead immediately. But the risk is there, and you can do better if you have the genetic data. And there is a randomized trial now. So this is the randomized trial that appeared in uh, this is from the Europeans. It appeared in in the New England Journal. It's after the ESC. It appeared in the New England Journal this fall. So the idea in PopGen was to randomize people who had uh, acute coronary syndrome event to standard treatment. The standard treatment in Europe is mainly ticagrel or prasugrel. Small number of people got clopidogrel, and to a gene or a genotyping group. The genotyping group just looked at the two major loss of function variants. If they had a variant, uh, they went to ticagrel or prasugrel. If they did not have a variant, they went to clopidogrel. And they're co-primary endpoints of basically thrombosis and bleeding. Uh, you have to sort of slog through the methods to sort of get to figuring out what what happened. But here's the data that that if you look at um, bleeding or you look at thrombosis. The genotyping group does better both times. And you know, better whether it's non-inferiority or superiority it makes a difference to, in the minds of some people. But I think that if what this shows is if you don't have STAR2 or STAR3, you do better with clopidogrel than anything else. So it's a better drug. It's not just as good a drug. Um, and there's a second trial that will probably be reported at ACC 
uh, called Taylor PCI from the Mayo Clinic, and it's about twice the size, similar design, and we'll see what that what happens with that, and and then maybe this will uh, this issue will either go away or maybe it'll become part of guidelines. So um, I've talked a lot about this, health records and genomics, but there's lots of other ways in which uh, you can sort of characterize personal health. I, I have to point out that these are these IPS cells are these are actually derived cardiomyocytes and, and they're beating. So that you know IPS cells are part of uh, the personalized medicine landscape. I'm not, I didn't get a chance to talk about them at all, but these come from our lab. So there are lots of things you can do. Images are really important. Nobody knows how to manage the image data set because it's so gigantic. We talked about this yesterday. Um, and then uh, lots of interest in uh, wearables and lots of interest in other omics, proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics. And then this other idea that sometimes, for many, many people, the genetic code is not nearly as important as the zip code in which they live. So whether they're close to a, uh, a grocery store, what the socioeconomic status is, those are really, really probably uh, very, very important uh, for many, many phenotypes. And then whether they can figure out how to take their medicines. So the real problem is that those are all important, and how to layer them on top of each other is a real challenge. And that's one of the things that the All of Us initiative at Vanderbilt, uh, at Vanderbilt across the nation is doing. We're the data and research center for All of Us. Uh, so our, our idea is to, ca this is a million person cohort, and we have to capture the data, store it in a secure way, and make it available to the research community in a secure way. I like to say that the grant is at Vanderbilt. We're the, we're the main site with our junior partners, Google and the Broad Institute. I like, I like, to, say it, I like to say it that way. Uh, and uh, I'll just close with, uh, with uh, an Osler comment, because I'm from McGill, so I have to say something about Osler. The good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. It's a picture of the uh, history of Medicine Library at McGill, which is where Osler's papers are. They're not at Oxford. They're not at Hopkins. They're here. Um, and then this is a picture of John McPherson, one of our interventional cardiologists. He has less hair now than in this picture. But uh, this is the first patient who we identified as a star 2, star 2. And John had given her uh, a coronary stent. So he knows her. He knows her other diseases. He knows what other medications she's taking. And now he knows a little bit more about how to personalize her care. So I'll close by just saying this is a real team sport. Uh, there are lots of people on this slide. They, the, the problem with this slide is that you have to be at Vanderbilt to get your picture on this. And when you leave Vanderbilt, your picture disappears. So Nancy Brown, you're, you're about to be dean, has already left Vanderbilt, so her picture is not up here, which it certainly would be. And then the sad thing is that Josh Denny's picture has disappeared. And it's now appeared at the All of Us initiative. So uh, yesterday was his first day at work as the CEO, the new CEO of the All of Us initiative. So he's disappeared and uh, leaving the rest of us to struggle with this process. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take a quick questions.